Okay. Okay, let's let's do a prayer and we'll get started. Almighty God, thank you for our privilege of being to able to come together and and Father, we thank you for your word and we ask that you would be with us tonight. Uh, send your spirit that would we would gain understanding into your word and especially as we begin to talk about uh, a very complicated, complex situation that seems a lot of people and and as well it should trouble all of us because we need to prepare ourselves to be ready for when that day of coming happens. And Father, we we here uh, as Christians want to know what it is to do to make sure that we can prepare ourselves and to be ready for when that day comes. And we do welcome that day. And we look forward to that day. And so we'll be talking about that tonight. And we ask that you would give us a spirit of understanding into uh, your kingdom. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, that makes all this possible. And it's in his name that we come to you. Amen. Amen. Okay, I want to make a comment first before we get started on the questions. But... Uh, <coughs> This is a, a topic that there's a lot of different ideas that people have about it and a lot of myths out there, and that's okay. It, it just happens that way. And so as we're talking about uh, some of this tonight, I want to encourage you that um, if you have questions that we don't get to talk about <coughs> to answer or you have some confusion about it, write it down and let me have it. And I'll or email me and I will get back to you. I will research it and I will you know uh, I'm I'm not someone who knows everything. I, I don't uh, see myself that way. Um, I do believe in the Word of God, and I do like to research Scripture, um, and I'm welcome to any kind of question. There, the only, the only bad question is the one that doesn't get asked. You might get some stupid answers sometimes, but there's no <laughs> stupid questions. Okay, so don't be afraid to do that because I, I welcome that honestly. Okay, and and so. Uh, please feel free to share your thoughts and we'll try to find it in scripture to clear it up. I believe there's, uh, we should be able to do that. Um, there is a lot of things that we're just not going to know. We just, we just can't know all there is to know about the end times. God has provided us with the information that we need to know so that we can be ready. And, and I, I, I look around the room and I, I, I feel like that's probably not a big problem for of us. I think you are ready, you know. And so, uh, and we're going to talk about that more tonight. I don't think it's a big surprise for a lot of people in this room because we're kind of looking forward to it, okay? So, um, any questions or comments about anything we talked about last week before we go further into uh, our study in Thessalonians? Anybody? I can't see with them and I can't see without them. <laughs> okay. We, uh, we started at the end of chapter 4 last week. And I think we finished up with our, our uh, uh, study guide that we had. And we're getting ready to... Uh, we were getting ready to talk about grief, all right? I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about grief, but there is uh, something I think we need to 
uh, make sure we understand uh, because some people don't. I've talked with a Christian recently that that kind of didn't because of a myth that's out there. Okay, that uh, Christians shouldn't grieve. You know that word should and shouldn't get us in a lot of trouble at times. You know, it, it's that 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 should word that we use and we. We beat ourselves up with it a lot of times. I should have done that. I shouldn't have done it. And I should do that more. I should do it less. And, and we tend to beat ourselves up with it. And this person was beating themselves up with something about, in terms of their belief system about a Christian's grief. And so I said, well, you know, maybe there's some people in the class that does the same thing. So we were in that verse 13 of uh, chapter 4. It says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men. No hope. Okay? And we talked about the, uh, the fall asleep word. We, we talked about that a good bit. And I think we have a, a good understanding of it. If not, please speak up. Um, and I wanted to... Uh, talk about that that word grief like other men do. Um, what do you think uh, Paul means by that? I'd say that a non-believer would grieve in a way that's much harsher or, or much okay. deeper. Uh -huh. uh, without the hope, that would just be total hopelessness. Okay, yeah. As far as yeah. grieving goes. Okay. Okay. Others. Well, I, I think it's much deeper than I think it's an entire outlook. I'm sorry, Matt. I think it's an entire outlook. Oh, uh-huh. Even culturally. Uh, when, I, when I look at t the way people act and the whole, it's in philosophy, it's in everything, is the premise is since there is nothing after this, yeah. everything's out now. Yeah. And that's a cultural shift. In other words, people look for fairness. You know, my, you know, I've got kids and, and, you know, we're sitting there and the kids like to tell you things aren't fair. Mm -hmm. I said, it's fair because everybody has an opportunity to accept Christ. It makes it fair on this earth. It's not so much that everything's fair. Everybody has that opportunity. And that's what we look forward to. You know, that's when everything's going to be set right. But when you don't have that confidence, that faith, you're looking for everything to be fair here. Yeah. And even sometimes, even with that faith, we're looking for things to be fair here. Yeah. But there's something to understand. There is no universal justice. No. There is no universal fairness. It doesn't exist. But grieving is a... a it is something that we all do. Um, Pat, you you know, you recently had a situation where very significant loss, and and that's a that's almost as that's at the pinnacle of of the grief losing losing someone that significant. Well, I, I think also you grieve differently depending on. If you know the person's decision to follow Christ, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, if yeah. you know a loved one yeah. is has accepted Christ, and you know where their final destination is yeah. going to be heaven, but if you're unsure, yeah, which I am unsure, yeah, uh, it's really hard to deal yeah. with, uh, yeah. because as long as they're living, you hold out hope that they will turn to Christ. You know, Pat, I. I I'm glad you brought that up, and I, I am truly sorry for you in terms of your loss there. I, I've been praying for you, and this, uh, I, I have spoken with people who have had that kind of loss, and then feel like for that reuniting, right? The God that I know is a loving God. More loving than 
I can even wrap my head around. And he, he knows you. And I, I, I just, I'm going to say this. I think he might would honor your prayers. So, you, you know? I know? Because he doesn't want you to not have hope. Right. That's important, like I, I've said in this class. Hope is one of those basic, fundamental Christian virtues. Faith, hope, and love. And we need those three. And we, we never we never truly know. Yeah, exactly. We never because it's God's will and, and those of us who love God, his will is his will. My dad had a, a Christian roommate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping in the last seven months his roommate mm -hmm. reached him where I couldn't. Okay. <clears throat> but it is yeah. it's it's hard when you're when it you're is. unsure. It I is. knew with my mother when my mother passed. I knew her she was a strong woman of faith. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I can't yeah. say for sure I know with my dad. Mm -hmm. I've had family members. I, 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 and I, I'm, you know. But grieving is something that we need to do. As a family therapist, when I'm working with a family, that's one of the things I want to know about is how does this family grieve losses? Because usually one of the reasons they're in counseling with me is there's a loss. Something, for whatever that may be, a uh, loss of relationship, a uh, loss of, uh, uh, or an endangered relationship. There's some kind of loss there. And I want to know how did, how did, when they were growing up, how did their family deal with losses? How'd they grieve? And that's critical for all of us to know because <laughs> one of the persons I talked with recently said, you know, well, I'm glad you asked me that question, Dan, because that was a problem in my family. We just moved on. Problem is, we didn't move on. <laughs> okay? <laughs> we just stayed stuck. And she said, now I'm beginning to realize that. Okay? And so th this is, grieving is critical. I printed off a couple of verses of script. Go ahead, Craig. I have an example of uh, biblical grief right here in Acts chapter 8. It's talking about verse 1, and Saul approved of his execution. Saul before he was converted. And then in verse 2 it says, and there arose on that day great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. Mm -hmm. They were deeply moved, deeply grieved at the loss of this, yeah. this great Christian yeah. man. That is true. And there's a bunch of scriptures that talk about it. I just printed off a few. Um, and one thing, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. He wants, he, he, that's, that's the empathy and compassion of our Lord. He, he feels sorry for us. We have a loss. He's right there with us. You know, he's right there beside us. Okay? Um, Jesus said in, the, in his first sermon, coming down in the Beatitudes, are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay? And, and He does provide that comfort. We still have that loss, and we still experience that loss, but through the Holy Spirit, we can be comforted, even in that loss. Okay? And, and Jesus cried. Jesus wept. The shortest verse of Scripture in the Bible, right? You know, I learned that in first grade. Jesus wept. Man, I could quote that scripture. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus wept. But just before that, the verse, the, first, the two verses prior to Jesus wept says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, 
He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He was grieving that loss. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So Jesus cares. He, he, he really does. Uh, and, and so grieving, Christians need to grieve in the right way. But seek first the kingdom of God for that comfort. And, and He will provide it because it, it, it's in mysterious ways. Okay? But we still have that hurt. We can still... And that's okay. That will go away in time. It changes. Okay? Questions? Comments? Anybody? So, all right. Um... We go to everybody's got the study guide, and again, if just write on that study guide. If you have something that comes up or a question that comes up that's not on here or something we don't talk about, um, don't don't go away confused or frustrated that. It, it, it's, it's not out there because we can put it out there, okay? Somebody can, can come up with it, all right? We can talk about it in here. So, um, there's a lot of, I put some scriptures there for you to look up. Uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, I thought was a good one, and that's what we're talking about here. It says, uh, I'm going to read down from 14 to through, uh, down through the end of the chapter. It says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. We talked a good bit about that first scripture. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That verse, um, or we who are still alive and will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, that's where the concept of rapture comes from. <coughs> That's probably on that. I think there's one more verse scripture in Second Thessalonians to where the vision of a rapture takes place. And because those two verses, thousands and thousands and thousands of books written about that. Some of them make sense and some of them make no sense. Okay? And so... Uh, we're going to get into it. Question number two. What gives us the assurance that the dead will rise? Because this is what was going on with the Thessalonians. Most of them were Jews. And the Jews did not believe in an afterlife. They, they did not believe in that. And so their friends and family had died. And so if there's a coming of the Lord's coming to get us, well, what happens to those people? They didn't understand that. And so Paul was concerned that that could trip them up because Satan will get in there and then twist around. You know how that goes. Uh, a lot of their thoughts... And, and then they could fall away because, oh, what's the use? And they'd lose 
what little bit of faith they had so far. Okay, so what what kind of assurance was Paul giving them in verse fourteen? And you got to remember here that it isn't just what's written in the book of Thessalonians that Paul shared with the Thessalonians. This is Take this in the context of the entire Bible. Because Paul was teaching these people all day and sometimes probably all night about Scripture, about the philosophy and the Word of God. So it isn't just that verse of Scripture that they have to go on, or we have to go on, right? Because we've got the whole Bible, the whole Word of God. And that's what Paul shared with them in the days that he was there ministering to them. So in verse 14, what do you see? Well, if Jesus rose from the dead, then why wouldn't we? Say that again, Pat. I'm sorry. Well, Jesus and you believe that, so yeah. why won't you believe that you're not God? Exactly. And and there were, you know, there were a lot of witnesses to that. There were over 500 witnesses over 50 days, and on 10 different occasions where Christ was seen after the resurrection. That particular time, that was just a very short period of time after that. That these witnesses. Plus, there were people who were raised from the dead, raised from the grave during the, the crucifixion. I can imagine, and I think you have to picture this, of the family that these people that raised, were raised from the dead and came home to their families at the resurrection and the earthquake that happened and all the stuff that happened during that three or four day period of time is very powerful and, and very overwhelming. And so that's what Paul is teaching them about. Okay? Um, Hebrews um, 2.14, I wrote, uh, says that since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself, he himself likewise shared the same things so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil. That was something they were very um, fearful of, was the devil. And so when, I mean, put yourself in their shoes, and, there, and if you could believe and listen to Paul, and, and, and you, 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 can, you can believe that, power of God is going to have power over the devil, then what else I got to worry about? And so Paul, Paul knew how to meet these people where they were and help them understand. And it was effective. Okay? Other comments about that? Question number three. Did Paul teach that Christ was coming within his lifetime? In verse 15, he talks about that. What does he teach? He does teach that Christ will come again. Yeah, in his that, time. That's what he says. That Christ is going to come again. And that the dead in Christ will rise first. That's what he says. <coughs> he did suggest in numerous statements that time and season is unknown. And we've all heard that. And, and we, we, we believe that, right? Anybody not believe that? That the time and the season is unknown. Yeah. 
And there are people today who it's going to happen on January 22nd at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because I've done the research and this is when it's going to happen. So, ready. Right? And we, we know of those times. I remember the one that's a spaceship's going to be up there and you, you be ready to, you know. Take us up on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Beam us up, Scotty. You know, and, and, and there was a lot of people sitting out in the field waiting. I mean, they're gone. Want to believe this, but they could believe that. I People, go ahead. I I think really, when you really look at this, I, I think that if you go back to the time when man fell, at that point God revealed that He had a plan to redeem mankind, mm -hmm. and that's always been the focus. And throughout mm -hmm. the Bible, it was presented, but. The plan wasn't there in, in total till it unrolled. And now we're at a point where, you know, people question, well, you know, what about, you know, the dead? And, and the simple fact is that the scripture told prior that the day would come and he came. And so this is just another part of explaining the plan as it goes yeah. along. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. From day one, when Adam and Eve fell short and they sinned, God said that there would be a redemption for mankind. Yeah. And from that point, it was a matter of believing. Yeah. We, we talked about that in, in terms of God's plan. He wanted a relationship with humans that he created. That's his plan. And he's going to make that happen. In, and even though there was disobedience and uh, there's been quite a few instances of uh, significant disobedience that's changed the, uh, changed the course of God's plan. Okay? But, but God is always in control. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit more when we, uh, when we address one of the questions. I, I would argue that no. I, Man has never changed God's plan. Okay, I'm going to give you some scriptures in a little bit. Well, the only reason why I would say that is because... Well, if, say that. If, say, I request you to say that because we're going to talk okay, about that okay. exact thing in just a little bit. And when we get into, uh, I think, verse, uh, question number 12, we're going, to, we're going to look at that. Because God's changed His plans a couple of times. And, and that's scripture. I'll share it with you. Um, and, but I think he knew he knew that he would do that. I, I, and I think that's probably where you're going with yeah. that. I mean, he does know that, and I think you're, you're right about that. But he did change his plans a few times. If, if you remember, Abraham was one of them with, with, that, uh, um, with Lot, because he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham talked him into not doing that yet. And God changed his mind. That's just one. There's others. But let's, let's uh, um, number four. Question number four. With what three sounds will the Lord descend? In verse six, what are you? What are the three sounds that happens when, when that, that moment happens? Did you say the voice of the archangel? Yeah. And the trump of God. There's a verse of scripture. I think I gave you this the study of the scriptures that John 5, 28 and 29 says that there will be uh, that's an indication that there's only going to be one resurrection. I, I've heard there's several, but there's, there's only one from what I'm hearing. But it says, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs it says all who are in the tombs. It didn't say most of them. It says all that are in the tombs, all the dead that are asleep, will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and 
those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And so there's a loud shout that's going to take place and it's going to sound um, uh, the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise and become new. Have a different, a new body, a new, a new self, a new soul. And they that have done evil. And they that have done evil. Well, it, those, those that have done evil. evil. Now, now, that's that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because we've done evil too. Because we're sinners yeah. too, and that's what sin is. Sin is evil. Oh yeah. But we're believers in Jesus. Christ who his blood shed on the cross for our sins our and so we're saved yeah provided we maintain that okay and we'll talk about more about that in a little bit but yeah and so where um who is the archangel Gabriel used to say yeah Michael. Michael. How many archangels are there? How many? There's there's two that are mentioned in the Bible. Gabriel and Michael. They're believing here. They, a lot of the commentators believe Gabriel probably. This is probably where Gabriel blows his horn. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> they thinking it might be you know either either Michael or Gabriel who blows the horn, uh, but Jude nine, look at uh, Jude nine. <laughs> says, but <clears throat> even the archangel Michael when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke you. He, he, he wasn't arguing, nor should we. <laughs> if the archangel is not going to fight with Satan, but sick God on him, sick Jesus on him, we should do the same thing. If you look at my first Enoch, I don't know if any of some of you've heard about that. He's in the pseudepigrapha. Uh, but first Enoch identifies seven archangels. Okay, um, Enoch was a prophet who traveled around with the angels. When you read his stuff, uh, and it talks about that in the Old Testament. He knew a lot of the angels. But now, in the, the, the Testament that we have, the Old Testament and New Testament, doesn't, doesn't discuss that. They do identify two different archangels, Michael and Gabriel. And they're talked about. And so they'll be there. Okay? They're, the ma- they're major ones to God. Okay? Um, on what occasion on earth was the trumpet of God been previously heard? This is Jeopardy. <laughs> Anybody? I thought that was interesting. I didn't. I, I never. I never. I didn't know the answer to that until I ran across it. Uh, but a trumpet of God was heard at Mount Sinai. When God gave the law to Moses, the trumpet was sounded. The trumpet of God was okay. And then there's numerous other uh, verses that talk about a trumpet was sounded, but we don't know if it was the trumpet of God or if it was a uh, uh, the, the archangel. It just says trumpet, so we're not about where it's coming from. Okay. But if you read reading first, let's read that. First Corinthians fifteen fifty two. Okay. Fifteen fifty two. Fifteen fifty 
it says, now this is referring to the trumpet at the last day. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling, at the last moment, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. Right? Amen. Amen. Uh, and and that's, that's if that happens after we go to sleep, after we move on from this life into uh, our sleep state. We call it being dead. But it's a sleep state because it's <laughs> we're just around like lying down on that couch taking a nap until it happens, right? I like that idea better, mm -hmm. you know, until God raises us up. And if we're still here, now we probably won't see those dead being raised. I've thought about this as I've studied this, is will we see that? Will we see that happening? Wouldn't it be cool if we could? It said the dead will hear that trumpet, but it doesn't say the living will hear that trumpet. It would be cool to see people flying up in the air. And but you know, that's what that. I'm wondering. Okay. Will we see it? Because there may be a soul. They don't know. If it's, they're, they're a part of the divine kingdom now. And so are they physically, are they physical realm? Okay? I'm, I I'm not sure. I just think it would be cool. Uh, yeah, it would be. I'd be outside waiting. But it'd be scary too. And I don't think God wants to scare us like that. Jim. Well, this is all supposed to happen in a twinkling of an eye. Yeah, an instant. It's a blinking of an eye. Yeah, yeah. how would you see fast. it? <laughs> I don't think we did. I might be cooking lasagna or something. I, I wouldn't see it, you know. Because a blinking of an eye, that, I've already blinked five times just seeing it. Yeah. That's pretty fast. Yeah. I thought as a preacher it'd be neat if it happened at the funeral of a Christian. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing. If you're in the casket, you know, they're, they're, they're there, you know. And we, oh my gosh! Now that would be. I got about. I just. Uh, I just subscribed <laughs> to uh, uh, a movie, a Christian movie channel called Pure Flix, and I just got uh, an email from them, and they have come up with about five more uh, movies produced about the end times, and about that what happens afterwards, what's before, what's and they're interesting to watch. Some of them, there's a little bit of, I think, outside the scripture, but, but to watch it. Some of them, a couple of them I've watched are, I think, right on, because I'm sitting there with the Bible looking some things up to see how, 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 how valued they were in keeping the scripture. And I thought, um, but anyway, uh, it's an interesting thing to because I think to think about that gives us a hope, especially especially in a difficult time. And I think that's that's one of the things God provides for us is this hope. And and uh, I've been in some situations in my life. Um, that I, I was very, I look thankful to God for that. Um, so, comments on that. Oh, here's a good one. With what does the word first make a contrast in verse 16? That that would take some um, In verse 16, the word first, it said, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. That's going to be a pretty noisy, busy time, isn't it, <laughs> moment, with all that going on. And the dead in Christ will rise first. What's he contrasting that with? 
the next those, verse. Those who are left alive. Exactly. The next verse. Yeah. It contracts those who are still alive and will be raised following those who are sleeping. First uh, Corinthians 15, I'm going to read 15, and we just read 52, but I'm going to read 50 through 58. Okay? First Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. I, I like this uh, paragraph. It says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And that's one of the things I think of why the dead's raising. I don't think you'll see a flesh and blood. I don't think you're going to see a body. Okay? Flesh and blood anymore. <laughs> First of all, that's all gone. If you're in a tomb, in the grave, that's going to all be gone anyway, probably. For most of them. So, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Now, there's a sermon, nor does the perish the perishable inherit the imperishable. Who are the imperishable? Who are the perishable? What's that contrast? Believers in right? the Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We're we are considered the imperishable as believers. Okay? And to behold, he says, I tell you a mystery. Good. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. This is where non-believers lose out on that immortality. Now they're going to be around forever, but they're going to be in hell forever. We're, that's a different place for us. We got a different reservation. Yes, Jim. Yeah, about that. I, I would think that the unbelievers in the end will have immortal bodies because if they're cast into hell, if they had regular human bodies, they'd just burn up, wouldn't they? I mean, if you got an immortal body, it can never be destroyed. That may happen after judgment. Okay. We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. okay. Um, they're 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 going to be ready to be judged. Yes. Okay. We skip that. We we kind of God Jesus is taking care of that for us. Isn't it also possible that their bodies could remain, but that the fire would have no power over them? Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. They were in their mortal bodies yeah. and fire had no power over them. That's, yeah. yeah. That could be possible. So, because they, they were imperishable. Right? That's the thing. I watched a movie with that on this pure flip thing. And when you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fire, and you can see them in the middle of the fire and then the king standing there watching that and then you see this other figure in there with them and the king is just totally bewildered and, and you know that story and that that, that was that was part so it's, I, a vi I mean i had my own vision of it from reading it but to see it on the screen is yeah it, it's a little different Makes you feel good because you know you're part of God and you're part of that kingdom, you know, and that's a good feeling. Well, the, you know, something interesting that I've always thought about is the problem is that everything in this world, including our own body, is corrupt. Yeah. You know, our spirit yeah. dwells within the body, but the body itself is corrupt. Yeah. So the body has to go. Yeah. And when you look at the 40 days in the 
in the wilderness when he was being tempted after his baptism. When you really look at that and tease it out, I think you're absolutely right, Matt. I, I don't believe he had a selfish desire. Well, where, where because I... that's, that's something that will be removed from us. Right. When we are made perfect like him, is we are we're rid of our selfish desire. That's where our sin that's where our sinfulness comes from. Right. Is our own selfish desires. Like when you point to that, I mean, why didn't he turn the stones into bread? Because that would have been self glorification. Exactly. And what did he say? How what was his answer to that? God man shall not live by bread alone. Bingo. Right, the word. The word. Every word. The word. And he was the word. Yeah. But I, I just the word. find that interesting to yeah. think about what made him perfect. I, I agree. Because, well, he was God. Yeah. In the flesh. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, he never desired the things of the spirit. One world. of the things we missed, and Craig, you, you were in when we were studying the unseen realm, and looking at all the times through it, the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. That this whole Bible is about that man, Jesus Christ, that Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, when he shows up as an angel or he shows up as a different and, and, and things like that's the unseen realm that we were studying, and that was very powerful. I, I really, well, we get digressing a lot, and we're almost going to lose time. But anyway, um, <laughs> well, I did good. Wanna, discussion's good, and, and uh, I'm glad you I, I wanted to say something about that. When you read about when Moses went to the burning bush, and it talks about I am. Yeah. Okay, well, that's God's sacred name. What's interesting is it says that his name shall be a memorial to all generations writes in the King James. <clears throat> well, what's God's name mean? Well, in Hebrew, each letter actually has a representation, just like it's a universal, you see on a bathroom, the symbol. Each letter has that. Well, God's name is behold the hand, behold the nail. Well, what does that speak? Christ on the cross. So yes, the whole entire Bible from God's name itself mm -hmm. is all about Christ and the work he did yeah. to redeem that was mankind. In the bush. Right. It, it's just it's phenomenal how that all works out. Yeah. So it says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And that's one of the things we've been talking about in this class, the very first class, what we talk about. The labor. What is the labor? It's faith through love. That's the labor. That's the calling that we're to do. That's what counts, according to Galatians 5.16. And so when we're doing those things, we're being like Him. We're imaging Him because that's what He did. That's what He did. And when you read His relationship with, with the disciples and with other people, you see that empathy and compassion and that that, that just that love that just goes beyond what we can even understand. I don't think we can totally wrap our heads around it. We can somewhat, but it's more than we can comprehend, I think. 
Okay? It, it, it's, it's that deep. So, um, that first makes a contrast that because the, the, get the next verse is what happens after the dead in Christ are verse 17. of us get to join them. Yeah. Yep. After that, we who are still alive are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Who is the prince of the air? Remember we talked about that last week? Who's the prince of the air? Absolutely. We're going to meet Christ in His territory, on His turf, on His corner. And I want to go, eh, <laughs> something like that. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to. I'd like to punch him out, but, you know, I, 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 know that, I can't go there. But that's, the human part of me wants to do that. But Christ is going to do that for me. So I don't have to worry about it. My bodyguard's going to take care of that, you know? And you don't mess with him. <laughs> right? And so, uh, they arise first. We don't know the time. We don't know how long after. We don't, we don't know that because it's not given. I don't know it if, unless somebody else knows it in Scripture. It shows that. I wasn't able to find it because I was curious about it. Harold Camping thought he knew. <laughs> yeah. Ten years ago. Yeah. 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 And 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 you know that's that's the thing we uh, I've got a whole bunch of scriptures that, that want to what do I do with that? Let's go there in the next five minutes. We've got some uh, and we'll we'll do verse eighteen through twenty two and get into uh, uh That's for 5, 18 to 22. We're going to get into. We're going to into five. But I just wanted to share these. Look at these scripture verses that I that talk about talks about how anyone can say I can know when that time is going to be based on just these few scriptures. So let's read them. We read five, John 5. Let's go to, we start with Acts 1 7. And it's, he said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. What? Well, that's all you need to know. You really don't need to read any more. I want to read some more just to punctuate it. But that, that right there. You know, he's fixed it on his authority. Daniel 2.21 says he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Jonah 3, 4 and 5 says, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. <laughs> and the people of Nineveh <coughs> believed God. This is what I'm, what I'm talking about. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. John 3.10 says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them, and He did not do it. He changed His mind, and He did something different. Because the people relented and turned back to God. Don't we pray for that, that this country will turn back to God? Why? So He might change His mind and save this nation so that we can be 
more of an integer to these evil nations that exist that 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 hold these evil people that are God. One of my devotions that I read is a, a Quaker from Pennsylvania named Hannah Smith. And she wrote all kinds of letters. You know who I'm talking about today? <laughs> She wrote all kinds of letters back in the 1860s during the Civil War and post-Civil War, and, and they, they made a devotional book out of her letters. In one of her letters, I mean, this lady is so devout. I, I love her to death, and I, I've never met her, and she, I'm sure she's just a corpse. But she said in one of her devotions, she prays to the Savior that when that tribulation happens and the time happens that the that thousands of tribulation that she would be saved left that time so that she could help minister to the people and disciple the people so that they could come to know Christ. You said thousand years of tribulation. Or not? I mean, yeah, years. but I knew, I knew somebody was going to correct me. I knew, I'm sorry. I'm just hoping I could slide. <laughs> but that's going to that that there's a lot of people that where I think when what we're talking about and that thousand years, I think that's where a lot of people get mixed up with the, about the tribulation and and about end times and. And about the last day of judgment, and and so it is confusing because it's not all out there. It isn't all out there, but it is uh, it is interesting to study. But Matthew twenty four nine nine through thirty one, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. Who are the stars that are going to fall from heaven? You know? Angels. Evil angels. Yeah, fallen angels. Yeah. The fallen angels. Okay? And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 24, 36 and 37 says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And that's the answer to one of the questions I asked that we didn't get to it tonight. We didn't talk about it. So therefore, Matthew 24 says, 42 through 44, therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. God has a way of pictures, don't he? With parables, analogies. He just, he just, oh, okay, I get it now. Right? So therefore you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So just be ready. But if that thief's coming in my house tonight and I know it, I'm going to be sitting there with my shotgun. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm going to be ready. What's What's really interesting is if you go back to the Exodus. If you go back to what? The plagues. What happened? They had all those plagues. Each plague mocked an Egyptian god. Oh, okay. now, I don't know what you're talking the about. The last plague that happened, what happened after it happened? The people mourned. And what happened? Well, if you look at it in context, this is after basically the, the base left. And now it's just the inhabitants of the earth. Okay. Well, there you go. It's, it's almost a parallel to that. Okay. Yeah. You know. Second Peter chapter 3. The Lord is to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any soul should perish. And that's, you know, nor should we want any soul to perish. But that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus what happened to my other anybody have the back part? My printer didn't print off that back part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, it didn't print at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, will be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holy godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <clears throat> So that in itself is some questions in terms of timelines and process and and how it all intersects, okay? And, and that, that just, there's quite a few things in that, just that verse of Scripture, I think, that arouses at least in terms of how things intersect in terms of times and processes. So Revelation 3 says... Remember, then, what you received and heard. Keep it. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you'll not know at what hour I will come against you. In other words, if you're awake and you're repenting and you're, you're confessing your sins before God and you're aware of where you are and you're trying to live a more godly life, and, and you're, you're going to be okay. But if you're not, woe be unto you. And this is for hard for people to believe. This is hard to accept. This is hard for non-believers. Not just hogwash stuff. And that's easy then. And they, can, they don't have change. People fear change. That's, that's one of the things I found out about this practice, right, Craig? People fear change more than anything else in the world. They will, they will allow pain to happen and happen and happen before they do anything to try to change anything. I, I, I don't under, you know, I do understand it, but I don't get it. it, it but that's what it is, and that's what Revelation 3 3 is saying. Revelation 16 <clears throat> 15 says, Behold, I, Jesus, am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake.
keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. <coughs> now that's a statement because in 3.18, he says, I, Jesus, counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of you will be gone. So if we don't have, have that shame, just like Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. Remember? They were shameful once they got caught. Before they got caught, they were shameful. Just looking at each other. But then God, they heard God walking in the garden and and he says, where, where are you? Like he didn't know, of course. And there they were, guilty, guilt-ridden, all those other emotions that happened to us. And, and, and that's, I don't know what will happen to those people, but uh, it's going to be undone. It's kind of like, and we'll talk about it when we get to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the, the pregnancy, okay? in that verse of Scripture that talks about a pregnant woman being in pain. And that... Oh, I'm way over. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I, uh, okay, I apologize. Uh, but we'll get to that. We'll talk about it. But it's... Um, oh, same thing. All those people who tried to convince... You need to repent, you know, you need to repent. Ah, we're okay. Peace and safety. Right? Peace and safety. Ain't no problem. I don't need to get in that boat. But what happened when the rain started? They're knocking on the door, right? And that's the way this is going to be. Unfortunately, there's no door for them to knock on. Christ is going to be knocking on our door to come get us. Dan, wake up. I'm here, right? I don't have to knock on the door. He's going to come get me. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll start next week with the, that the next question and finish up. We're, I'm trying to finish up. You don't we'll have finish to. up number five. And There's no next. way to Pardon? There's no Wednesday night next week. No revival. Wednesday night next week. Revival. Did God change that too? Oh, that's right. Revival. We're having a revival. The youth are in charge Wednesday well, night. Right. Yeah. Okay, I forgot about that. Yeah. The youth are in charge of it. <coughs> yeah. The youth are in charge yeah. of it. I, I forgot about that. Yeah, because I'm doing Saturday night. Yeah. Okay. Joe's doing Sunday night if there's a night you want to skip. <laughs> <laughs> when are you speaking? Saturday, 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 the 22nd. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing uh, the, I, I'm, I got the right night. I'm doing Halloween night. <laughs> and, and the, the, uh, you can have that. Overcoming darkness. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Okay, let's, let's pray. We'll... Heavenly Father, thank you for being here with us and thank you for your word. And, and Father, we, we do uh, thank you for your plan and we trust you. We love you with all our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And we, we want to know more about how to prepare ourselves to, so that we can stay awake and so that we're ready and, and, and we know we want to be with you but we want to honor you and glorify you and so help us Father to do that and to grow in, in more understanding